as he comes. Thank you, Pastor, and good evening. And uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedules uh, to be here this evening. And thank you for being willing to be a part of, of prayer ministry and altar ministry. Uh, one, it's an incredibly exciting thing to, to be a part of somebody's life and they're coming to know Jesus and you are part of that and, and they experience healing or God ministers them in some way and, and you got to be a part of that. So thank you for coming to get equipped and prepared. Um, we pray that the Lord will use this time that we're together to help equip you for this type of ministry. Now, um, what we'll be doing this evening is we will be going into two sessions. The first session will be focusing on um, ministry to people who responded to a salvation type of altar call. And you've been asked to work with them. We're going to try to help you some things to help you to help them as they come into the kingdom of God. And then in our second session, we'll be looking at more of your more general altar ministry time. You're praying for needs of people and uh, focusing as well on helping people receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And at the close of that time, we, we will uh, be taking time to, uh, to pray for you, especially if you've not yet received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, this DVD is going to be made available to not only this congregation, but it will also be made available to other churches who are wanting to uh, get serious about equipping and training their people to be a part of the harvest that we believe that the Lord wants every church to experience. Anything I teach this evening is subject to adjustment by the leadership of this congregation in order to fit the DNA of this church because every church develops its own DNA the way that they do things. And it's also uh, maybe adjusted to fit the circumstances of any given uh, time of altar ministry. And so there'll be things, for example, that I would talk about tonight to say this is what normally would take place. But there may be a moment in a given service that the pastor will say, this is what I want to do. And so I want you to understand that from the outset, that these are general principles, but there will be times of adjustments for some of the specifics. Uh, no one way to minister is completely right or completely wrong. And often when I'm involved with training people in this area, people say, but I was taught to do it this way. And the way they were taught is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that way. But it may not be the way that uh, the house that they are in, the church they're part of does it. Or in a case, if I'm involved with a ministry and a crusade of some sort, it may not fit the way that we feel that we need to work at the altar during that particular series of meetings. And so we just ask people to be prepared to make an adjustment for that period of time. It just is helpful if we're all pretty much on the same page when it comes to altar ministry. And uh, ministry, um, ministry at the altar, whether as an altar uh, worker gathering details on a salvation invitation or as a prayer team member ministering on a Sunday morning or in a youth meeting, it is an incredible privilege and responsibility. It's an incredible privilege when I think of the fact that uh, God might entrust me with His anointing. And that God might entrust you with his anointing. And what a privilege to have God himself place something of his anointing onto you and into your life to be able to minister to somebody else. I always view that as a privilege. It's a privilege because the leadership of this congregation has entrusted you and entrusted me with the opportunity for service. To have the privilege of being able to minister into somebody else's life and the leadership of a congregation say, we trust you to be able to do this. And we, we want to entrust this to you. It's also a privilege because people have opened their hearts and their lives to us at an altar. And we have the privilege of ministering to that. It's not only a privilege, it's also a responsibility. It's a responsibility because we are being allowed to possibly touch some of the most sensitive areas of people's lives. People are often more vulnerable at an altar than almost anywhere else because there's a place when they're standing before the Lord and people that they trust that they may open themselves up in a way that they may not in any other setting. And so it's an incredible responsibility to minister to those people in that situation. We are also being entrusted with the reputation of our pastor and of this church. 
Now, I am aware that some people that you will pray with, whether it's at the salvation or whether it's in general, you know, altar ministry, they will simply see you as the person that laid hands on them at the altar. No more and no less. But others will see you as an extension of the pastor. You become the official voice of the church to them. And sometimes you are somewhat expected to carry the anointing of that meeting or that church. Now, before somebody begin to panic right now and say, hey, I'm out of here. This is too much. Let me tell you, relax. Uh, we're going to touch on some of that in just a moment. I used to often say to my young people when we'd go to events as a church, I'd say, hey, guys, I want you to understand that at this meeting, you represent three things. You represent the Lord Jesus Christ and everything that you're saying and doing at this event. Number two, I said, you represent the church. And number three, you represent me. And don't you blow it in any one of those. Well, there is a sense as an altar worker that you are, you are representing the Lord Jesus you are representing this church. You are representing the pastor. So that's why we want to do it the right way, the best way that we possibly can. We're also being allowed to stand between God and people. And that's a part of God's plan. God has always chosen to use people. He didn't have to. He could do something else. But he's always chosen to use people. He said, for example, that he would make those who followed Moses out of Egypt, he would make them to be priests before him. In fact, he promises the same to you and I in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 when he says this. He calls us a royal priesthood. And of course, priests stand between God and man. They bring God's message to people and the people's needs to God. Now, I tell people growing up as I did in the Assemblies of God, Pentecostal church life, uh, I didn't really understand priests much because we did not do priests in the church that I grew up in. But I do understand that in the biblical concept, the priest stood between God and man. And he brought God's message to the people, and you'll get to do that. You get to say to somebody, you've been forgiven. You know, that's an incredible to look at somebody who you just prayed with on a salvation altar call and to say to them, you have been forgiven. You just brought God's message to them. But also you get to bring their needs before God. And you are praying with them and, and, believe, and bringing their needs before the Lord. What an incredible privilege to stand between God and man. Now, I don't want you to be overwhelmed by such an assignment to where you say, I don't think I can do that. And you just decide to stand down right now. The facts are this, none of us are capable in ourselves. None of us. Uh, I've been at this a number of years now. I've been preaching a long time. I started preaching when I was 17 and in high school. And I'm a little older than 17 now. And I've been preaching a long time. And, and there are times that I know that people look at me like I know something. Like I have an answer. Like I got this magic something somewhere. And there are times that I've stood at an altar and somebody has shared a need, and, and honestly, my very first instantaneous response on the inside, sheer panic. What am I going to do? How am I going to respond to this? How am I going to minister to this? None of us are totally capable in ourselves. But I do believe that we can be taught. We can be equipped. We can be equipped in the things of the Spirit, and we can be equipped by the Spirit. And we can be equipped in the practice of dealing with people. And we can be equipped in the Word of God. And part of tonight is about that part of equipping. Equipping us to be able to minister at the altar, at the, at the time in a service where people are responding to the Lord. And we are helping them as they are making connection with God. So for those of you at the handout, I'm down now to personal spiritual preparation. And there's six things I want to suggest to you. Uh, but before I suggest them, let me tell you this. Perfection is not required. But certain spiritual attitudes are very important. Now in one sense, you only need to be one step further down the road than the one you're ministering to. You don't have to have all of the answers. 
This is a dumb illustration, but let me do it very quickly. My, when we first went to itinerant ministry and we moved our boys out of, a, out of the school system, of, of uh, the public school system, went into a homeschooling because they were traveling with us. When they reached the age, it became my responsibility to teach them algebra. I am not well versed in algebra. And from some of your responses, I can see that some of you understand that feeling. And, and every single week before the algebra lesson, I would read the material and I was only staying one or two pages ahead of them. Okay, but I did know more than they knew for that occasion. Now, I must not have done too bad because my oldest son went on in university to be the algebra tutor for the basketball team. And so I, I guess we must have succeeded. Now, to be honest, do I know much about algebra today? No. I don't, but I learned enough to help them at that point. You don't have to have all of the answers, but what we're going to do is try to help you come to the point you at least know more than the person you're ministering to and able to help them to take that next step in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. On the other hand, you do need to be mature enough not to do more harm than good. And uh, for example... Always understand when the situation you are facing is beyond where you are at spiritually and have enough sense to say, you know, that's really a very important thing you're sharing with me and I think pastor needs to talk with you. And some years back, we were involved with with an invitation at a a church. Uh, Meetings had gone several weeks. And and there was a lady responding at the salvation altar call. And and the altar council was praying with her. And and somehow in the course of prayer, she simply asked this lady, do you have some issues or habits that you're struggling with? And she said, I don't even know why I asked. But she did. And the lady responded with a type of, of situation that she was struggling with. That this altar worker thought, that's bigger than I am. And she turned around to see who she could get to help. And it happened to be that I was closer than the pastor was. So so she said, quick, would you come here and would you help me? She was a very smart individual to understand that what she was now being confronted with was beyond where she was. That's not wrong to be in that situation. You're going to grow. You're going to mature. And one of the things I love is the way God is able to put the right person with the right person at the altar And I've seen that happen so many times that a situation that's where you have been in your life and suddenly you're ministering to somebody, whether it's the salvation altar call or another area, and suddenly you're ministering into an environment that you have been there. And you can minister that because you understand where they're at and and where it is God's going to take them to. And uh, so I want you to be relaxed with that, that God's going to put you in the right situations. But if you find yourself in one that's bigger than you are, don't panic. That's when you just go up channel, up line. You get the pastor, you get whoever's in charge of the altar ministry to come and to help you. Maybe you find yourself in a situation where deliverance is being called for and you know that's not where I'm at and you can get somebody who does that sort of ministry and and then turn the person over to them. The first thing of the six I want you to see in personal spiritual preparation is this. Develop your own devotional life. Now that is so Simple, I'm almost embarrassed to put it on the handout. But yet it is absolutely the base for all of kingdom life and ministry. Your development of your own personal time with the Lord is the underneath platform for everything that's ever going to happen in your life and your ministry. You see, the most important thing I do today is not stand in front of you. The most important thing I have done today, I did this morning when I first got up. And that was spend time with the Lord and my own personal time with the Lord. For all of the anointing, all of the understanding, everything else comes out of that relationship with the Lord. So as an altar worker, the first way you're going to prepare yourself is to develop consistency in your own daily time spent with the Lord. Number two, it's very important that you seek to come to the meetings spiritually prepared to minister. Especially if you already know that you are on roster for that particular Sunday. That you're one of those that you will be ministering to those who respond to the salvation altar call. Then you want to come spiritually prepared to do that. But even if you're not on roster, I want you to be spiritually prepared. Because what we want to see God do is surprise us. With the sort of responses that are so big. 
we were ministering in a church sometime back that was well known in that area of the states for being in revival. And I'd been asked to speak for one of the Friday night meetings, and God graced that night. And when I gave the invitation, there must have been 75 or 100 people that responded on the salvation altar call, and they were prepared for like 25. And suddenly, you know, they're, they're, they're grabbing people and saying, here, you come up here, and you, you do this, and you do this. And, and that's wonderful that, you know, that it happened, but how much better if every person came in equipped and prepared to help bring somebody into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You do not have to respond to this, but isn't it amazing how many family arguments will happen just before going to church? <laughs> you know, something will come up, something will take place, uh, and you know, between the house and the church, you know, there's this period of frozen silence you know, in the car as you're driving, and then you walk into the building and trying to minister. You see, Satan knows when to kind of set the things off to put you in a position where you minimally do not feel like you are qualified to minister. Um, the scripture admonishes in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, and it's specific admonishment to pastors, be prepared in season and out of season. Well, that's good instruction for altar workers too. To always be prepared. So first seek to be prepared or to be ready. This is to be ready spiritually by your own preparation. Is to be ready emotionally and to be ready intellectually. The understanding so that you know what it is you're going to do when they ask you to come and to minister. And that's a part of what we hope to do in the next several minutes. To help you to know what it is you're going to do when the pastor or myself or the speaker may be ask you to come to minister to those who responded to the salvation altar call. This is a preparation that's in season and out of season. It's to live our lives so that we are ready to pray with people at any time. Equipped to go at the drop of the hat, so to speak. The next thing I want you to understand in this personal spiritual preparation is be teachable. None of us know it all. I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly being reminded of things that I should already know. None of us knows everything. And it's so important that we stay in an attitude of being teachable. And then number four, I want us to be submitted to the leadership of the church or the leadership of the meeting that you're working the altar at. Rebels do not need to apply. If there is something to impartation, then the last thing we need to do is impart rebellion to somebody else. The scripture says this in 1 Samuel 15 and 23. Rebellion is like the sin of Witchcraft or divination, NIV, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because, he said, you've rejected the word of the Lord, he's rejected you as king. Saul's attitude of rebellion cost him his kingdom. So it's clear in this verse that God takes a dim view toward both rebellion and arrogance. And so I just need to be certain that those are not a part of my life. And, and I don't say that in any sense, you know, to, to be improper. I was in a meeting where I knew that there was people on the prayer team who had developed a spirit of rebellion. And I finally asked if I could address the prayer team. And I just told them, I said, I want you to hear this from my lips. I don't want you praying for anybody. Because if there's something to you imparting of your spirit, the last thing I want to impart it is your rebellion added to their rebellion. I said, that's, 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 that's big problems. So it's important that we have the right spirit ourselves as we're ministering to others. Number five, and Pastor will deal with this in specifics in another session, but understand the systems of the house. Please work within the process your church uses. Well, I don't want to fill out that card. Well, if it's a part of the process that your church uses to stay in touch with the people that respond to Salvation Altar Call, then it's important that you fill out the card. You know, why do we got to do it this way? Well, part of the reason is we want others to know that this is a safe environment. For example, this is, you know, at some point, I pray this comes, that you had the point that you have to have a little badge on to people identify who you are. You know, that you're a member of the prayer team or the altar worker. And, and you say, well, why would that ever be significant? Well, I've done meetings where what happened became so large and so many people coming in that suddenly we didn't know everybody. 
We didn't know all the people that were there. But we want to be able to say to pastors, this is a safe environment. And so people were taught and they were given, you know, a, a little badge to wear. So we can say to people, those who have the badge are those who are equipped and trained to minister to you. And we could say that the pastors, these people understand the process. And they're not going to be doing things that are going to be harmful to your people. Now, you're here because pastor already believes that about you. Now, if you weren't here, if he didn't believe that, he would not have sent you an invitation to be here. But he believes that you're teachable and, and you have the right spirit so that you can minister to somebody else. And that we appreciate that. And then pray, number six, for sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Boy, I pray that on a regular basis. Holy Spirit, I want to be sensitive to you. I, I want to hear what you're saying as I go to minister to this individual, okay? Now, what I've just shared with you is valid for every type of altar ministry. Let me focus now for praying with someone who has responded to a salvation invitation, leading someone to Jesus. Here's my assumption. We're going to be assuming for this teaching that we're talking about praying with people who have responded here at the church or in some sort of meeting the church is, is hosting or sponsoring to a salvation or repentance type of altar call. Now, what I'm going to say will work in other settings, but I'm not focused so much now on, you know, helping to lead somebody to at work to Jesus, although you can take what I'm going to share and do that. But we're going to already be in a setting where this person has already indicated they want to give their life to Jesus. And so, and you're going to help them to do that. Now, let me tell you this, and I maybe should say this later in the mess and in, in, in the teach because it kind of fits there, but just crossing my mind. We had a, a situation where a, a lady had given her life to Jesus, and she was so excited about what the Lord had done in her life. And she was doing a little neighborhood coffee, and she's just talking to her friends about Jesus. And, uh, and one of them was really, really interested. And so they moved off into another room, and she's talking more to this friend about Jesus. And she finally just said to this friend, would you like to give your life to Jesus? And the friend said, yes, I think I would. And the lady said, wait just a minute. Let me go find the prayer. Now, she was so new, and I'm going to touch on this in a moment. She was so new herself. I think she got saved like the first or second week of the meeting. And this is a few weeks in. And, and she had actually taken a, a notebook and a pen. And when I would pray night by night with people to receive Jesus, she had written it down. And so she went and got the prayer and brought it back and said to her friend, I think you say this. <laughs> and just led her friend through this prayer first time ever. And you know what happened? Jesus saved her friend. Her friend was schizophrenic and psychotic. And from the moment she prayed the sinner's prayer, she never heard another voice. She was instantaneously met by Jesus. She went from this expression of just, you know, just gloom about her to the spirit of joy that was about her. So her friend didn't know a whole lot. But she had equipped herself, and at least, what should I say? If I'm going to lead my friend to Jesus. So we're going to kind of help you with that. Every preacher will be a little different in what they do at the altar. So what I'm going to do for the next few moments is kind of typically what I would do if I'm preaching and giving a salvation or repentance invitation. And for most preachers and pastors, it would be fairly standard what I'm going to say to you. I will have asked the person to come that wants to give their life to Jesus, to invite them to the front of the building, and they'll, normally they'll be coming and standing. Once they're there, typically what I would do is I will ask those who are the altar workers, that would be you, to come and to stand behind those who responded to the invitation. Now, if the church sets up a roster and you're on roster for that Sunday, may I encourage you, when the pastor says, I need the altar workers to come, uh, don't wait for a second invitation. You know, move immediately. And so that just a very, very short order that you are standing behind somebody. Now, typically that would be, you know, a man standing behind a man and a woman standing behind a woman. That's normally, you know, the best process to, to work on that. But just come and stand behind them. Now, normally, I will lead the people in some sort of repentance prayer. That would be typical that I would do that. I will give you the exception in a few moments. Normally, after I do that, I might, or one of the pastors might take a few moments to give a little discipleship, a brief discipleship teaching. 
It will not be intense. Not, not at that moment because they don't know anything. They're just getting started. I don't want to overwhelm them. So I'm probably not going to talk to them about some deep theological truth. I'll say things like this in that first First altar time, before I turn them over to the altar worker, I may say something like this. You know, now that you've given your life to Jesus, here's just three things that you really need to do. Number one, you need to come to church next week. Not very complicated, is it? But I may say something like that. You just need to come to church tonight. I just want them to realize that it's not, they can come another time. I want them to come to church. I may say something like this. Now that you've given your life to Jesus, you can start talking to the Lord God every single day of your life. I may talk to them about stop sinning. Depending on the nature of the meeting, I may talk about some of you doing things that you know Jesus does not want you to do. So what I want you to do is right now just purpose, and you know, we're going to pray with you about this and ask God to help you. You're going to quit doing that. Now, typically, I would say to them, that's also important that you get baptized in water. Now, interesting, we often assume that people know what we're talking about when they don't. And I had given uh, an invitation on this at a church. And in two weeks' time, they had like 46 people responded to a salvation altar call. 27 absolute first-time conversions. Out of that group, when I said, I want you to get baptized in water, they said this to the pastor. Now, pastor, we understood when he said, come to church tomorrow night. Okay, we understood that. What does he mean by be baptized in water? You know, one of those glitches, one of those assumptions that everybody understands that, what I discover is increasingly in the world that you and I live in, they don't. There's, it's not that they're stupid, it's just that they're unlearned. And we have to teach them. So I come to the point, I, I basically assume that a sinner doesn't know anything. And I'm going to have to help them to know everything that they need to know. Now, after I pray that little prayer with them, and I've maybe done a little sharing, I will normally tell them that there is a friend standing behind them that they haven't met yet. That would be you. And I would say to them, I want you to meet this friend, and they're going to come and talk with you for a few moments, and they're going to pray with you for a few moments, and they're going to be getting some information from you that's very important. And sometimes I'll say something like this. Now, they're not going to ask you for a donation. You know, they are going to ask you for your name and, and, and you know, some details, how we can get a hold of you. And here's why. So we're not going to send you a bill, but we are just as serious about helping you get to heaven as the devil is about getting you to hell. And so what we want to know is how can we help you? How can we get in touch with you to see that you're doing okay? And I've discovered when I take that approach, most people are very, very comfortable to give me the information that we're going to ask them for. Now, that procedure that I just gave you may not always happen. For example, it may be that I'll say to people, they'll come and they may kneel to the front, and I'll say to you, I want you to come and just kneel beside somebody, and I want you to pray with them. I want you to lead them to Jesus. And I may not do anything other than, you know, basically at that moment, then turn them over to you. Because sometimes the time structure of a service is such that you really don't have the opportunity to, to do anything more at the altar. It may be that we're going to be sending them to a side room where you're going to pray with them and counsel with them. And so there really isn't time to do anything further than just, you know, have them come and respond. It may be that there's two or three that have responded, and there's some other areas of ministry that we know God wants to go into. And, and so again, a time situation, we may say, I want you to minister to these friends in salvation. And so it's very important, you know, for them to pray, but the facts are most unbelievers have no idea how to pray. And so often I'll say to them something like this, I'm going to pray a prayer, and what I want you to do is I want you to repeat this prayer after me okay and and that's what you'll do you'll repeat a prayer you'll say a prayer just have them repeat it after you well what are the types of things that would go into that prayer well, let me suggest the following types of things will go into that prayer number one there's going to be confession that they have sinned now that could be words like this lord i have sinned lord i've 
disobeyed your word. I've hurt you. I've hurt others. I've hurt myself. Lord, I have rebelled against you. And things of that nature. Where at some point they are acknowledging before God that they have not been living for the Lord. It may be simple, Lord, I've not been living for you. I've been living to please myself. And so, Lord, I want to admit that to you. Okay, so the sinner's prayer at some point, however you word it, is going to have this inclusion, I have sinned against God. The second component is a petition for God to forgive them. Lord, I'm going to ask you to forgive me. Lord, would you take away my sins? Lord, would you wash me with your blood? You, you can use different phrases. Somebody said to me one day, I was trying to pray the prayer with you, and I got the words messed up. Does it count? Now, you and I may think, you know, that's cute, that's funny, but they were serious. You know, they didn't know anything, and they were really concerned that if they didn't repeat it just like I said it, that it didn't count. You know, they weren't going to get to go to heaven. And so I said, hey, listen, I want you to know this. The moment you left your seat to come to the front to give your life to Jesus, you got saved. At that moment, the Lord forgave you. And I said, our prayer is just to give you some ammunition against the devil. I said, but really, it's a decision in your heart and in your will more than the words that you're going to say. But having said that, it is significant for most people to be able to know, I prayed, this is what I asked the Lord to do, and this is what he has done. And so there's going to be a petition where they're going to ask the Lord to forgive them. Lord, would you forgive me? The third thing that's a part of the sinner's prayer is an acknowledgement that Jesus is Lord. He's God's son. He came to the earth to forgive their sins. He lived a sinless life. So I may say something like, like, something like this. Lord, I believe you're the son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. See, at some point, this understanding that Jesus is more than just a person. He is the Son of God as well. So we're, we're not just buying into a system of teaching. We're coming into a relationship with a person who's more than just a human. He is human, very much man, but very much God at the same time. The fourth component of the sinner's prayer for me is a surrender of self to the Lord. It words something like this. I invite you to come into my life and into my heart. Jesus, the best I know how, I ask you to come and live inside of me. Lord, I ask you to be my boss. Lord, I surrender myself to you. Now, a phrase, one of those phrases, something of that nature where they're now saying, Lord, I not only know that you are the Son of God, but I am surrendering myself to you. I'm giving you control in my life. You say, often say this to people, salvation is not partnership. It's not that I'm asking God to be a partner in my life. I'm asking him to take charge. You see, it's, uh, it's, it's unconditional surrender to him. He does not negotiate. Well, Lord, I want you to be 50% my savior. You know, 50% of my life, I want to live and do my own thing. It's total surrender to him, Okay. And so I, we want to say that. And then the sixth thing is uh, giving of thanks. I'm sorry. Let me back up once. Acceptance of salvation by faith. Acceptance of salvation. That may go like something like this. Lord, I believe that you have forgiven me. I receive your forgiveness. I accept you into my life by faith. And then an expression of thanks. Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for coming into my life. Now, you can develop that in the words that you are comfortable with, but a sinner's prayer basically involves those type of things. And so whether you know, they have prayed that with the pastor, or whether he said to you, I want you to lead them through a prayer to where they can receive Jesus Christ as Savior. And again, you don't have to know a whole lot, just know more than they did. Uh, I was illustrating one night on, on personal witnessing and I, in, in the church I was pastoring. And I, I had one of the ladies there. And I just was walking her through a little 
you know, pattern. I finally said to people, I said, does that make sense? And she said, it does to me because that's what you did when I got saved. And she was then there to take the very same thing that she, I had done with her and, it, and she in turn did it with a friend who came to Jesus. And that's what's going to happen with you. Now often, if the circumstances permit it, I like to ask them to take the next 30 to 60 seconds and talk to the Lord out of their own heart using their own words. Often I'll ask them to do that. Would you take the next 60 seconds, 30 seconds, and just tell Jesus in your own words what you want him to do, what we just together prayed about? Why do I do that? Because I want to begin to get them into the routine of using their own words to talk to the Lord. And I discover that often something very significant begins to happen when now they're activating their thought processes. Now they're not just rote repetition. Now they're thinking about, Lord, this is what I want you to do. And it's not unusual at that moment for people to have this incredible encounter with the Lord. Now, let me back up just a moment in our sense that we're standing at the altar. And let's say this time that we have prayed the sinner's prayer up front. They've repeated it. And I have now said to them, there's somebody standing behind you that's a friend that you haven't met yet. Typically, I will ask the person who's working the altar to come and stand in front of the person. I won't turn the person around where they're facing the audience. That's intimidating. So rather, I'll have you come and stand in front of them so they're facing the front with their back to the audience and now you are facing them and you're facing the audience as well. And introduce yourself to them. Now, in some cases, you will already know them. In some cases, it may be somebody that's connected to the church family, somebody that you've been praying for for a long time, and you may know them. You just greet them by name, and they already know you. But there'll be others that you will pray with that you don't know. So the very first thing you do is just ask them what their name is and tell them what your name is. Introduce yourself, you know, and just say, man, I'm Michael, and your name is... Reagan, man, Reagan, I'm so, I am so pleased what you just did. I'm so excited that you gave your life to Jesus. You know, you, you introduce yourself, find out who they are, and affirm immediately. As soon as you can, you want to affirm to them the decision that they made. You have just made the greatest decision in your life. I'm so proud of you for that. I'm pleased. I made that decision. I'm glad you made that decision. Because you see, there's a mix that takes place in people's lives. On the one hand, there's this instant awareness, I did the right thing. And some people, there'll be an incredible sense of the peace of God that floods them immediately. But some people don't feel anything. Sometimes we do this disservice to talk about this awesome feeling you're going to have when you get saved. Not everybody feels that. You know, some people do. But my father, when he got saved, he felt nothing. In fact, he destroyed his pastor's theology. Because his pastor thought you had to weep a bucket of tears to get saved. And my father just walked down to the front and knelt down and very unemotionally prayed this little prayer and asked Jesus to come into his life and got up and walked out the door. And they said to the pastor, what happened? He said, I don't know. And dad showed up that night and showed up for the next 40 some years. You know, called into ministry and became a pastor. It was a decision of his will. Not his emotions. Sometimes emotions are connected. But it's a decision of the will. And and some people immediately, as soon as they pray that prayer, there's a battle that starts inside of them. You know, some people, it's awesome. But for some people, the devil immediately begins to tell them, that's not real. You're an idiot. So I just want to affirm to them, man, that decision you just made to give your life to Jesus, that is the most incredible decision. I am so glad that you have done that. Okay, now I have found the following types of people will respond to a salvation or repentance type of altar call. And when you're ministering to people at the front, you will find yourself dealing with one of these types of people, okay? Some of you will find yourself dealing with those who have never been saved. First time repentance, first time salvation. Those are fun. And yeah, we all kind of want that, you know? And, and, and the mistake sometimes you make is to think that that's the only valid thing that God does. It isn't. But it is one of the groups. And we love that. And that's the group that probably won't know anything and won't even suspect anything. 
and you get to help them in that incredible moment of coming to Jesus for the very first time. But in every altar call that I give, there's normally some backslider. That is somebody that was once in a relationship with the Lord and walked away from him It's coming back to Jesus. And so it's every possibility that you're going to be praying with somebody who once knew the Lord, has gotten away from him, and is coming back to the Lord. So it's not wrong for you to ask somebody, and I'll talk about this again in a moment, about asking questions. If you just ask somebody, you know, is, is this, you know, have you ever asked Jesus in your life before? Is this the first time you've ever prayed a prayer like this? For some to say, yeah, it's the first time. So I say, no, I prayed like this when I was a kid. You know, so it gives you a sense then of what you're working with a little bit more. And, and, and it's not wrong that you're praying with a backslider. I don't want to dismiss it or take that lightly. Because I pray with people, they've been backslidden for 20 years and 30 years and have come back to the Lord. And for some, you know, they have just, you know, kind of walked away in the last few weeks, okay? But there will be backsliders. The third group who will respond to a salvation altar call are those who are religious but don't know God. They're religious but they don't know God. I believe uh, somebody said the other day, I heard them say this, that, that in one study in the Methodist church in the States, they estimate as high as 70% of people in the churches do not really know Jesus as Savior. They're religious, but they don't know God. And I never cease to be amazed at the people that I deal with in altar responses who are religious, but they didn't know the Lord. I'm thinking of two of them real quickly. One was a young lady that uh, 12 weeks she had been in service as I was preaching in a place. And she said to me, she said, in fact, I was always, always amazed that she kept coming because she was, she'd get so mad at me every night. And then come back the next night and just get mad at me again. Come back the next night and get mad again. But she finally said to me, she said, you know, when you first came, she goes, I would have told you I was fine spiritually. My father was an elder. She said, but as these meetings have moved along, I became aware of the fact I was religious. But I did not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can be religious and not know Jesus. Happens all the time. I prayed with deacons for salvation. As in one church, half of the deacon board responded on the salvation altar call. That messed up the pastor. He said to me, he said at the service, he said, do you think they understood the altar call? His wife said, they understood it. It was really clear, and I've been praying for this. I gave a salvation altar call in one church, and the pastor's wife responded. Nobody wanted to pray with her. They didn't know what to do. This is a large church, several hundred. And afterwards, she said this to me. This is not my words. These are her words. Now you have the story of a pastor's wife getting saved. Around the church. Religious. Now what had happened, for those who are panicked, uh, she was the pastor's second wife. His first wife had died. And she was a secretary of another church in the area. And they had, you know, met the circumstances. And, you know, and he had begun to date. And she was a very good woman, a wonderful woman. But he later said to me, I always knew there was something, just not quite. My wife said to me, she said, I knew the first time I met the lady. Wonderful woman, but there was just, she was religious, but she did not know Jesus. And there will be people who respond to an altar call. It dawned on them. I don't really know Jesus. So you may be ministering to that. That may be you, in fact. And that would be wonderful. If you're here tonight and you're religious and you don't really know Jesus yet, you know, before you leave this building, you get to know Jesus. And that would be, you know, that would just be, that would be really cool for that to happen. Fourth group are those who have a sin, have sin in their life, or they have an issue that God is dealing with. Now, in any given service, this can, include, this can include people who are normally, you know, who are saved. I know when, it, when I give a repentance altar call, as soon as there are people who are at that altar, that I know if Jesus were to come, they'd go to heaven. I know that. But I also know that there's an area of their life that God is dealing with them about, and they need to respond to the Lord and deal with that issue. In fact, personal illustration. I was in, uh, 
I was in Brownsville at the revival there several years ago, and Steve Hill gave this really intense in-your-face altar call, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to go to the altar. And I said, but Lord, I'm an evangelist. That was a case he had not realized that yet, you know. Lord, I'm an evangelist. And, if, and I've been preaching meetings, you know, that go for weeks. And there are people in this meeting. If I go up there, they're going to see me. And he said, I know. <laughs> That's why I want you to go to the front. Because I want to deal with that pride. I wish I'd have gone the first time. The invitation to come, because by the time I finally said yes to the Lord, I was standing at the back of the line, which meant the entire congregation could see me. If I'd responded at first, you know, I'd be way up here, and the people behind me, nobody could have seen me. And sure enough, sure enough, Reagan, when the meeting was over, some kid walked up and said, I know you, you preached a meeting in my church. I said, see, God, I told you. <laughs> but there was something in my life that the Lord wanted to deal with. That's not a negative when God says, I want to deal with this in your life. And the number, the fifth thing that will happen is there will be some people at an altar and they don't know why they're there. You do not deal with very many salvation altar calls until you recognize that that takes place, that there are going to be those at the altar and they don't really know why they came to that altar. And so you're going to have to help them discover why they came to the altar. All they know is they felt like they were supposed to go to the front. That's all they really picked up. I'm supposed to go up there. And, and I'll, I'll help you walk through that in a moment. The sixth thing that, the reason the people come, there, there will be those who are under condemnation, not conviction. Okay? And so what they're struggling with is assurance that they've been forgiven. Okay, there will be some who will respond at, at an altar call, and they've already asked Jesus into their life, but they're struggling with assurance. They, don't, they feel condemned. And, and the difference, by the way, between conviction and condemnation is this. They both feel the same. If you're under conviction, you're going to feel terrible. You know, you are. Remember when, before you got saved, how some of you felt? Just terrible. Conviction. Condemnation makes you feel terrible. Here's the difference. The purpose of conviction is to bring you to Jesus, is to bring you to repentance. And then when you repent, conviction has done its job. It lifts away. Condemnation stays. So if somebody has prayed a sinner's prayer, they've genuinely asked Jesus to forgive them, and the condemnation, the heavy feeling is still there, they're not under conviction, friend. They're under condemnation. And you want to help them to understand that, that what you're feeling is condemnation. And then you're going to walk them through some verses of Scripture of assurance of salvation. By the way, here's one other reason people come. Sometimes people respond to salvation altar call, because it felt so good to get saved last week. And they want to get saved again, because it felt so good. This happened just a couple of weeks ago. I was preaching in a church, and, and there was a young lady on the, on the salvation altar call. Fifteen people or so responded, but she was on the altar call. And, and I don't know why, but when I got, I'm just going down the line telling people they've been forgiven, which is so much fun to do. And I get to her, and I just started talking about, you know, it doesn't really matter what you did. It doesn't matter the stuff you've been involved in in your life before. I want you to know that Jesus forgave you. And she started weeping. What I did not know was what her background was. I didn't understand the type of stuff she had been involved in. And Pastor said, when you were talking to her, said, just like, wow, you were describing right where she had been. But it wasn't just her. Everybody else in that room is hearing it one-on-one -on -one when I was saying that to her. Because it wasn't coming in a condemnatory. It was just very, you know, loving, helpful, encouraging. But the pastor told me this. And said, you know, actually, she came to the Salvation Altar Call last week for the first time. But it felt so good to go to the front of the building and to pray and ask Jesus to wash her, she wanted to feel that good again. Now, I could get bent out of shape. You shouldn't come up here again. You came last week. <laughs> no. I don't, I don't care if they come six weeks in a row until it dawns on them, till there's revelation by the Spirit of God. My sins have been forgiven. So encourage them and love on them. And it's significant. You know, they may just want, it felt so good, they want to feel it again. And that's okay. So 
they've come to the front, you've introduced yourself, you've welcomed them to the family of God. Now, I will nearly always ask a person something like this. Why did you come to the front of this building? I want to find out how much do they understand of what that invitation was. You know, I came to give my life to Jesus. They understood. You know, I, I'm away from the Lord and I can't give my life back to the Lord. They may say, I don't know. Their responses will tell you a lot. In fact, here's, four, here's some reasons their response may not make sense. Because you're thinking of what the message was that was just preached, that the evangelist preached or the pastor preached. It's really clear to you why they should have come to the altar. But they've got this kind of vague reason they're there. And sometimes it's because they don't really understand the altar a whole lot. You know, it's like their first or second time in church, and they just felt like they should go to the front. They don't know really why, but they just felt they should come to the front, so they did. And, uh, and, and you're going to have to help them to work through that. It may be, though, that God is dealing with them in an unrelated area, and the spirit of conviction has drawn them. So maybe it wasn't the specific message but in that spirit of conviction, God spoke to them about another area. So their answer may not make a lot of sense to you, but it may reveal what God's speaking to them about. It may be they're overwhelmed with their own sense of need. They may be, as I said, they want to duplicate the experience of last week, or they may be without a clue. And I catch those. So when I get one of those, I keep asking questions. Rephrase them. Why did you feel like you should come to the front of this building. What was going through your mind when that invitation came? What were you asking God to do when you came to the front of this building? You know, I lo I'm looking for expressions that are not religious to help them, to help me to understand where they're at. I may say this, can you describe what you were feeling while the pastor was preaching. You see, those things help you to understand where they're at and what they understand. Helps you know what the need is, how you're going to help minister to them. I may ask them this. When you prayed that prayer with the evangelist, when you prayed that prayer with, with pastor, what do you think that God did? I nearly always ask that question. When you prayed that prayer, what do you think that God did? Now, this will help you to know if they understood what God is doing. Some people will know immediately. I know what God did. He forgave me of my sin. But there's a significant percentage that say things like this to me. I don't know. I'm not sure. And sometimes they're trying to find the right answer, the correct answer. And there isn't a correct answer. I want to know what's going on inside of them. So I may reword it like this. And, and they really just struggled to explain why they came. I may say something like this. Some people have this sense or feeling of having made, been made clean on the inside when they prayed that prayer. Like they took a bath on the inside. Or some people have this sense that a weight was taken off of them. And then I may say this, not everybody experiences that, but some do. Does that describe what you experienced? Some will say, yeah, that's a good description. Now, now you're understanding what's going on. And, and they say, yeah, I really felt like all clean on the inside. And I say, well, that's exactly what happened to you. You just got clean. You just took a bath on the inside. The blood of Jesus just washed you on the inside. What well, they say to me, yeah, I kind of felt like this weight that was on me is taken off. I'll say, that's exactly what happened. You were carrying a weight of sin, and Jesus just removed it. Okay? So I'll keep asking questions to help me to understand what they understand, and then to help them to understand what took place. Some people will feel things very deeply, and some will not, much have much, will not have much of an emotional experience at all. Emotion or lack of it does not reveal either the depth of the repentance 
nor the depth of the salvation. I'll tell them this. Here's what I think God did. Once they tell me what they think was happening. I, I, I asked them, well, here's what the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9. And I'll take, it, take them to that. I'll show them in the scripture. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then I'll ask them this question. Are you ready? I'll ask them this. Did you confess your sins? Did you ask God to forgive you of your sins? And you always get the, yeah. If they didn't, it's like, well. Well, if they didn't, then pray again. Okay? But they said, well, I did. Well, what does this verse of Scripture promise that God will do? And usually they'll well, forgive my sins. So, what do you think God has done? Allow the Holy Spirit to cause the lights to come on on the inside of them. And I love this, about this time when you start watching truth hitting them. I've been forgiven. Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, has given them that truth. Or I may take them to John 1.12. And we're almost done with this session. Just a couple more minutes. John 1.12. To all who received Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become the children of God. So I may say this to them. Did you receive Jesus into your heart as we prayed that prayer? Did you believe that he forgave you and came into your heart and life? Uh-huh. Well, then what does he say? You just became his child. And they often will respond with a question. His child? And I'll say, Yeah. I'll say, Reagan, that's exactly what happened to you, man. When you prayed that, you became his child. And then you watch. Again, the lights go on. Revelation takes place in their heart. How can I say that? Because God says it in his word. It's just not based upon my emotions. Now, I love the feelings, and I want them to feel it. But ultimately, they're not saved because they felt it. If my salvation is based only on my feelings, some people are not saved until the second cup of coffee in the mornings. You know what I'm talking about? You just don't feel anything until that second cup. I want them to know their salvation is not based upon their feeling. It's based on the fact that God promised them something in His Word through what Jesus Christ did on the cross for them, and they asked Him to do that. And because God, who is not a man... Numbers 23, 19, that he should lie, neither the Son of Man that he should repent. Hath he not said, and shall he not do it? Hath he not spoken, shall he not bring it to pass? So they can know. Why can they know? Because he said it. Because if that's not valid, friend, then neither you nor I have any solid basis for our salvation. Now see, I can take you to moments in my personal journal where I was going through a serious spiritual battle, and on the feeding level, I wrote these words, and I was a preacher, I was preaching meetings. And I said this, on the feeling level today, I don't feel saved. But I worked my way through what God's word says, thus and such. And I've done what he said in his word. And if he hasn't done what he said in his word, then he is a liar. And you know what? He is not. All of my mistakes, my blunders, the dumb stuff. In fact, the good news is this. He doesn't expect me to clean up first. Just as I am, the songwriter said, without one plea, that thy blood was shed for me. He invites us to come and to say, Jesus, I want to ask you to come into my life. I want to ask you to Forgive me of my sin. Come and live inside of me. I want to totally surrender to you. You see, there is a pattern for salvation. You find in the book of Romans, chapter number 10, where he says that in verse 9, that you believe. You believe that Jesus is God's Son. In the next verse, it says that you ask, you confess, you acknowledge with your lips two things. You acknowledge I sin. 
One of the things I've learned over the years is at some point I have to own up to what I've done wrong. David put it this way, I sinned against you, Lord. You own me. No excuses. Lord, I blew it. I sinned. I believe that you're the Son of God and I acknowledge that I sinned. And as I ask and I believe what He promises in His Word and I ask Him to come in, Romans 10 and 13, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be. I love that. I love that. Incredible promise. Whosoever. One more time, would you help me? Would you look at the person next to you and just say, Hello, whosoever. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's who you are. You can put your name in that passage of Scripture. Because when God wrote that, when He put that on the Apostle Paul's heart, He had you in mind. You were the one that He was thinking of. The Vietnam vet said to me one day, Sir, you don't understand what I did. You don't understand the types of things that I did in Vietnam. I said, no, sir, I don't. But I do understand what he did yeah. on the cross.